lecture. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Brown Bag Talk. It's my pleasure to introduce Julia Earl. Julia is a Canadian archaeologist. She earned both her bachelor and master degrees in archaeology from the University of Toronto. And now she's a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin. Julia has been working in Peru since 2015 in different archaeological projects and has been directing research at Cusco since 2019. Julia research interests include construction technology, labor organization, and the built environment. Today, Julia will present a talk entitled Building the Sacred Valley, Landscape Transformation During the Kilke Period, 1000 to 1400 CE. While well, Julia, the virtual stage is all yours. You can start to share in your presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Sean, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to share my research today. It's such an honor to be here. So I will go ahead and share my presentation. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, okay, so today I'm going to present some of the preliminary results and observations from the field, uh, field research that I conducted in the Sacred Valley in 2019. And um, I'm specifically going to be talking about the results that pertain to the period leading up to the, to the Inca's imperial expansion across the Andes. Um, and this period is known as the Kilke period. Um, so the Sacred Valley is arguably one of the most monumental or yeah, one of the most monumental landscapes uh, that the Incas built. They invested uh, huge amounts of labor and resources in cultivating a very distinctive landscape aesthetic here um, that supported their sovereign ideology and political economy. Um, this was one of the first areas that the Incas started to uh, interact with outside of the Cusco Basin. And um, this uh, interaction would have helped inform how they developed uh, different approaches to building an empire outside of the, uh, outside of the heartland. In this presentation, I'm going to start by establishing how local landscapes were organized prior to Inca incursion, and then uh, track uh, the gradual changes in the built environment as the Incas started to exert increasing influence and control in the Sacred Valley, sort of setting the stage or beginning to set the stage for uh, more intensive development later in the Inca period. So here um, for this presentation, I'm going to be following Bauer's regional chronology, which he outlined in his book, Ancient Cusco. So this chronology varies a bit from uh, Rose Ica based chronology, which is what's used um, for a lot of uh, the area um, or elsewhere outside of the Cusco region across the Andes. Um, so this chronology is based on the appearance of different ceramic styles in the Cusco region. So we're looking at the Kilke period here, uh, which aligns roughly with the late intermediate period. Uh, but the Kilke, the Kilke period runs from about 1000 to 1400. Um, and in the Indian highlands, uh, this period follows the collapse of the Wari and Tiwanaku states and it coincides with a climatic shift. So it's a time of significant social upheaval for people in, uh, living in the highlands. At the beginning of this period, um, people were reorganizing their societies um, we see people adapting uh, to these new uh, environmental and political conditions by migrating into new regions, mixing with different ethnic groups and relocating their settlements, and also adopt, adopting new cultural and subsistence practices. During the Kilke period in uh, the Cusco region, there's a range of different local ceramic styles being made um, that are local to specific uh, regions. But we find during this period that we start to see Kilke style pottery being uh, widely distributed. And this style of ceramic, uh, or the ceramic style is uh, produced, uh, or appears to, be, to have been produced in the Cusco Basin where the Incas originated. So the distribution of Kilke pottery is usually understood to have resulted from some kind of uh, interaction or influence uh, uh, coming from uh, the early Inca po uh, polity in the Cusco Basin. By about 1400, we start to see the appearance of classic Inca pottery 
And this corresponds with the coalescence of the Inca state and the consolidation of the Inca heartland. And so this earlier date of 1400 lines up um, pretty well with some of the uh, radiocarbon dates that are starting to um, come out of the Cusco region in, in recent years. Like for example, um, Berger's recent dates for Machu Picchu, which uh, predate uh, Rose uh, date of 1438 for the beginning of Inca imperial expansion. So during the Kilke period, the Incas interacted with a wide variety of different groups who occupied the area surrounding the Cusco Basin. So here we have the Cusco Basin right here. Um, and this, this map, which I've adapted from uh, Bauer's book again, um, represents the distribution of ethnic groups across the Cusco region during the Kilke period and the approximate territories uh, that these different ethnic groups occupied. And these are some of the groups that uh, were mentioned in uh, some of the ethno-historic literature. By around 1400, uh, the Incas had uh, consolidated much of this territory around Cusco as their heartland and uh, proceeded to expand across the Andes. And um, depending on their relationship with the Incas, some of these ethnic groups that lived in this area came to be designated as Incas of privilege, who were not Incas by blood, but had gained some degree, some, some status um, by willingly submitting to Inca rule rather than resisting, but they still paid tribute and were considered lower ranking than the Incas that lived in Cusco. On the other hand, um, other groups were said to have betrayed the Incas in some way, and as a result, they were destroyed and effectively erased from the landscape. The Incas also claimed that a lot of these lands were empty and undeveloped, leaving them open for annexation and development. But and increasingly, uh, recent archaeological research is beginning to show that a lot of the Incas' claims about local groups and their lands were not true. This research has also revealed Inca territorial expansion to be quite a messy and negotiated process in which both locals and Incas were implicated and um, elites were working to serve their own immediate interests. So um, early Inca expansion wasn't necessarily this kind of top-down unilateral uh, process that the chronicles tend to describe. Um, and so this is uh, generally considered to be the sacred valley uh, here running along the uh, Urubamba, Vilcanota River, um, basically between um, Ollante Tambo and Pisac. And it's about 20 kilometers away from Cusco at its shortest distance. And then this is the region that we're going to be looking at in detail today. Um, you can see that it's occupied by a few different ethnic groups, the Kuyu, the Poques, the Huayacan, and the uh, Kelka groups which are mostly located in these sort of hilly areas and tributary valleys. Um, there wasn't too much so settlement along the valley floor, except uh, a little bit um, up in this area near Ukai here. So this is a view of the Sacred Valley near Kalka. Um, you can see that it's quite a um, sort of more humid and fertile landscape. Um, and in the Sacred Valley, we find arguably the highest concentration of Inca states, monuments, and land development in the empire. At least six uh, different Inca rulers established estates here uh, from Yawarwaka to Huascar. Um, being at lower elevation, approximately 3,000 meters above sea level, uh, the valley floor experiences a warmer climate than the surrounding region, making it ideal for maize agriculture. However, parts of the valley were originally swampy or gravelly with meandering streams. So the Incas uh, canalized about 23 kilometers of the river to reclaim land along the valley floor and improve drainage. And uh, the result is basically the form that the river uh, still holds today. According to Covey's regional surveys during the Inca period, the people living in this region established new villages on hilltops and slopes where they had access to diverse ecological zones and were practicing broad spectrum subsistence, ecological comp complementarity, and managing risks by um, exploiting different resources uh, along the hillsides. 
there's not much evidence here for regional or local hierarchy. These societies tend, um, tend to look fairly egalitarian and political power appears to be fairly localized. This is in contrast to um, the Incas and some of the other groups in the Cusco region, like, like the Ayarmacas, who were at this time producing surplus uh, to manage risk by practicing irrigated farming, establishing their settlements on valley floors and slopes. Um, and they, uh, these other groups tended to have uh, also a, a more markedly hierarchical settlement pattern and more evidence for social inequality. So um, in 2019, I directed pilot field work uh, in, in the Sacred Valley, which involved site survey and reconnaissance at 23 sites uh, within the Sacred Valley and its tributary valleys. Um, I selected sites to include a sample of local early Inca and later Inca sites. And um, my project takes a diachronic focus. So basically looking at changes that occurred over the Kilke and Inca periods. But again, today I'm primarily going to focus on the Kilke period. Uh, the project builds on Covey's survey of this region, which was focused mainly on reconstructing the regional settlement pattern. The project or the field work performed um, site survey at, at some of the sites recorded by Covey, um, documenting architecture, terrace systems, tombs, and quarries in order to generate more of a higher resolution picture of variation and change across the study region. And for the purposes of sampling and recording, we divided the study area into a grid with cells of one kilometer squared. And at the site level, we imposed a grid of 50 by 50 meters and randomly sampled one structure per cell. We also conducted reconnaissance along the valley floor here. And um, we determined chronological affiliation of structures and sites based on uh, associated diagnostic ceramics. Some of the sites included in this study like Pucar Panticlia have already been excavated and have radiocarbon dates. So we know a bit more about their occupational history, but others don't have that, um, that kind of information yet. Um, and I'm planning a second field season for next year, which will expand the study area towards uh, Urubamba and Oyanti Tambo and include radiocarbon dating of grass inclusions in mortar in order to chronologically situate uh, construction activity and generate a more refined architectural chronology. So here I'm going to just be discussing preliminary observations that I'm planning to test during my next phase of field work. So um, to begin discussing the results, I'm going to try to reconstruct how local landscapes were organized in two of the tributary valleys included in my research. Um, so the Chongo Basin and the Kibra Carmen. Um, and then I'm going to move into discussing how uh, the Incas were entering into these landscapes and the ways that they were modifying and interrupting the built environment to support their political interests. So the first area that we're going to visit is the Chongo Basin right here. And this is the region that was occupied by the Kuyu ethnic group. The Upper Chongo Basin corresponds to the Sunni and Puna ecozones. So it's about uh, 3,500 to 4,000 meters above sea level. It's ideal for the cultivation of tubers and herding of camelids. And to take advantage of this cold and humid landscape throughout this area, the Kuyu people constructed these sloping terraces, which are cross cut by ditch canals that irrigated the fields using natural runoff. There's not really any indication that water was controlled or restricted in this area. So agricultural production was probably managed uh, primarily by local communities and kin groups. And the terraces uh, seem to have been constructed gradually over time. The largest local villages in this area are located on hilltops overlooking this vast agricultural landscape. Um, one of these villages is Muyuchurku, um, which is located on this ridge top up here. And today, uh, herders bring their flocks to this area to graze. This could be similar to how uh, people were using these terraces in the past with camelid manure serving to fertilize terraces, which has been described in some of the ethnic, ethnographic literature on terrace use in the Andes. Um, and so in this way, herding and terrace cultivation um, 
it could have had something of sort of a symbiotic relationship. Open sepulchers, which are also known as chulpas, are dispersed throughout this landscape. These structures were built to house large numbers of deceased individuals and facilitate ongoing physical interactions between the living and the dead so that the deceased could continue to be active members of society. In the Chongo Basin, they're usually found in pairs on small promontories overlooking the landscape. Sometimes uh, they are found alongside rock art depicting camelids and red pigment. Within the study area, we document a, um, a wide variety of different kinds of tombs, uh, so not just chulpas, uh, that tend to overlap in their distribution, but we found the highest concentration of chulpas in the Chongo Basin uh, within the study area. Even though chulpas are considered to represent a pre-Inca tradition in the highlands, it's worth mentioning that in the Cusco region, we're starting to um, find a lot of radiocarbon dates coming from chulpas, both from um, construction material and from excavation that indicate that some were built and used well into the 1400s. So for example, at Cachicata uh, with Benson's work, uh, Minas Pata uh, and Ahna Pampa. So uh, local peoples and their mortuary traditions uh, don't appear to have really gone extinct by the Inca period, but rather local peoples continue to build and modify the landscape in culturally significant ways. This is Pucara Pantiglia, which is one of the largest villages uh, in the Chongo Basin. Covey's radiocarbon dates and excavation data from the site indicate that the main occupation of the site was between about 1100 and 1500. The site was initially established by the Cuyus and later co-opted by the Incas as an early administrative center, but it lost regional importance when the Incas established a royal estate at Pisac. In the chronicles, the Cuyus are said to have been destroyed by the Incas for their purported uh, treachery, but the architecture and radiocarbon dates uh, from this site indicate that this was not the case and rather uh, people continued to live and build in this site. And uh, the Incas and Cuyus probably maintained uh, somewhat close ties uh, well into the Inca period. So the site is flanked by sloping terraces for uh, dry field farming and platforms to level the terrain and to accommodate the construction of dwellings. There was also settlement along the ridge top here. Um, some of these buildings along the ridge top appear to be public or administrative in function and others um, reflect some, um, some Inca influence. This is an example of some of the uh, local vernacular architecture here. Uh, most of these buildings tend to take circular, uh, squarish or D-shaped forms. Typically they have these roughly square shaped niches here. Um, uh, and they also tend to have windows. Walls are double phased and blocks are worked into roughly regular size and shape. Walls are often plastered. There's some variation in the quality of masonry at this site, which might reflect uh, some differential access to specialized labor, but generally the masonry style and construction techniques uh, found at this site are pretty consistent across, um, across the site. At least some of the building stone used in construction was quarried uh, within, within the site. Um, we identified two uh, quarried outcrops, one of andesite and one of limestone. This is one of the rectangular structures that is associated with uh, the Inca occupation of Pucara Pantiglia. It has a very regular rectangular form uh, that is very typical of Inca architecture, making it really stand out from the local vernacular forms at this site. But as you can see, um, it was really, it really appears that it was uh, built using the same masonry and construction technique as the local vernacular structures. And it shares a lot of the same features that are typical of vernacular architecture here, such as the windows and the square shaped niches. This uh, seems to indicate that local laborers were uh, directly involved in the construction of Inca architecture at Pucara Pantiglia, and also that there was some degree of negotiation and compromise as to how Inca architecture was materialized here. That is, there was some flexibility to adjust Inca forms to local traditions and values. 
So the next area we're going to take a look at is the Cabral Carmen and specifically looking at the site of Marcus Sunaim. Um, this area was occupied by the Pokes ethnic group. Um, as far as I know, there's not too much uh, mention of the Pokes in the Chronicles, but there is a brief comment by uh, Garcilaso that Manco Capac established some towns in the territory of the Pokes. So um, this is a local village and the structures at the site were distributed between these two promontories uh, positioned on the top of a hill at around 3,900 uh, 3, meters above sea level, uh, overlooking the surrounding area with a view of some, of, some very uh, prominent mountains and lakes in the area and access to the Puna. Structures here are built on platforms uh, along the slopes. They're, they're generally squarish and D-shaped in form. And I want to point out this single uh, rectangular structure right here that I'll be coming back to in a moment. Oh, and also um, we have this really uh, sort of intricate canal system that uh, traverses the, uh, the site. Um, so here's a closer look at it here. Um, and this, this canal would have carried runoff from the human puna to the east of the site and also drain some um, of the water down to the terraces below. So it de demonstrates a considerable investment in controlling water at Marcus Unite. Um, like Pukara Pantihlia, the landscape around Marcus Unai is covered in these sloping bench terraces for dry farming, which are cross cut by uh, ditch canals for irrigation. In terms of mortuary architecture, we identified at least four different types of tombs at this site, which are uh, each distinguished by their morphology and attachment style. So um, broadly, we can distinguish between chulpas, which are uh, freestanding structures, and cliff tombs, which are attached to rock outcrops. At uh, Marcus and I, we do have several chulpas that are positioned on some of the slopes near agricultural terraces and within uh, uh, or even among the dwellings themselves. But we also have a lot of cliff tombs, which are embedded into a single outcrop in the western part of the site. Cliff tombs tend to be pretty variable in terms of form, but they're often quite small and um, often tend to look like they were only built to contain a single person in contrast to chulpas. And I'll give an example of this um, uh, this type of tomb uh, further along in the presentation. But at Marcus Unai, we also have a few examples of this type of tomb that I'm showing here, which is basically like a small chulpa, but attached to a rock outcrop. So it almost appears to be sort of hybrid between these two traditions. Within the study area, we only found this type of tomb at Marcus Unai. So by paying attention to some of these differences in tomb construction and thinking about some of the um, different kinds of interactions and relationships that they would have facilitated or inhibited. I think we can begin to identify uh, some different religious traditions and different ideas about the dead that local people uh, living in the Sacred Valley uh, held. And um, the diversity of tombs here at Marcus Unai seems to suggest that there was quite a lot of dynamism in terms of culture and mortuary practice here, but whether this would correspond to a change over time or the co-residence of culturally diverse groups is unclear. Overall, in terms of the architecture, the buildings that Marcus Sunai are built in a pretty expedient way. There's hardly really any attempt at coursing. The walls are very thin, only about 30 centimeters uh, in uh, thickness. There's a lot of evidence at the site of remodeling, renovation, and repair of the buildings, which seems to speak to uh, the temporality of construction. That is the, the site layout doesn't appear to have been fixed or static, but it was ever changing. Every family or each family probably built and remodeled their own dwelling according to some shared principles and values, but I would argue that there wasn't much attempt to really create, create durable buildings that would last because the cycle of reparation and change was an integral part of social life. At Marcus Unai, there's not much uh, indication of Inca influence or occupation, except for this single rectangular structure that I pointed out earlier. Um, as you might have noticed on the um, uh, on the image of the, the map of the site, uh, it's not really located in a central position within the site. 
but it seems more peripheral. Um, but like Pucara Panticlia, the form is very rectangular, so it stands out quite dramatically from the local vernacular architecture. So this is for comparison, um, one of the uh, local vernacular structures at the site, which is much smaller and of course had, has a very different um, form to it. Um, and again, just like we see at Pukar Panticlia, uh, the masonry is very similar uh, in this in this rectangular structure, very similar to the local vernacular masonry that we have at Marcus Sunai, except that the structure actually appears to be a little bit better built. You can see that there's more uh, more coursing, more alignment amongst the blocks. They're more uh, regular in terms of their size and shape. The walls are thicker and double faced, so uh, it appears that they're meant to be a little more durable than the vernacular architecture which again points to a difference in temporality of construction. There was more of an intention here for this building to be built and to last rather than to be continually renovated. There was perhaps some oversight or guidance um, from perhaps an Inca administrator or architect as to what an Inca structure should look like. But again, there was uh, room for the involvement of local laborers and the accommodation of local values and traditions. Something that's still not clear is the use and function of these sort of Inca related structures and what they really mean about the relationships between uh, locals and Incas. Um, and also to what extent locals initiated the construction of these buildings or whether uh, the Incas had coerced locals to build them. So I want to compare these examples of these Inca related structures and the ways that Incas uh, are intervening in local landscapes. Um, that we see at Marcus Unai and Pucara Panticlia with um, a few of my next examples here. The next area we're going to look at is Capacancha and Palu. So Capacancha is positioned on this hilltop up, hilltop up here and Palu is located on the valley floor. This area was part of the territory of the Huayacans who had actually a marriage alliance with the Incas. So they had quite a close relationship early on that uh, later deteriorated. And like the Kuyus, the Huayacans were apparently destroyed by the Incas. These two sites are associated with the sixth and seventh Incas. So uh, Inca Roja and Yawarwaja. So Capac Cancha was uh, one of the major villages uh, occupied by the Huayacans. It's uh, located on the top of this really steep hill at around 4,000 meters above sea level. And this is about 1,000 meters off the valley floor. The hillsides are again covered with these sloping bench terraces. There's not much local vernacular architecture preserved here, unfortunately, but we do have um, this uh, really remarkable Inca complex, which is undoubtedly the most prominent feature at this site consisting of a huge rectangular platform and three uh, rectangular structures along one side. The platform is positioned right on the outermost edge of this hill, uh, offering a panoramic view of the valley floor and snow-capped peaks like Pitusirai, uh, Pitu Sawasirai, which was one of the most important apus uh, in the Sacred Valley. Um, and this, the, these structures would have sort of been blocking access to this platform, so it's uh, possible that uh, private ceremonies could have taken place here. So here's just a, a closer view of one of these rectangular structures. And we see that um, the, the entry ways were at some point um, closed to this uh, structure. Um, one of the entryways might have been opened more recently, uh, perhaps for the use of the structure as um, uh, a corral or a, or a dwelling. Um, but we, we don't have any um, examples of classic Inca pottery on the surface here, uh, just Kilke. So it's possible that this complex might have been closed and abandoned when the relationship with the Huayacans uh, or the relationship between the Huayacans and the Incas deteriorated. So before the onset of the, the Inca period. There are, of course, a lot of features of this building that really wouldn't be considered classic Inca. Uh, for example, the uh, placement of the niches. Um, there's also this bench along the back side of the wall. 
And again, the masonry is really not classic Inca, but um, it's a lot higher quality than the local vernacular masonry that we've seen at the other sites so far. Um, and uh, this suggests that unlike Pucara Pantiglia and Marcus Unai, local laborers probably didn't play a really significant role in constructing these buildings. Instead, specialized masons and architects were probably brought in from Cusco or elsewhere. So again, you can see that these, there's a lot more effort in terms of um, working these blocks into uh, pretty regular uh, sizes and shapes. Um, much higher, we, we see much higher investment in construction here. Um, the building stone for the most part is uh, local found within the site. Um, there is some andesite incorporated into these structures that might have come from a bit farther away, but uh, overall these buildings and uh, this complex here at Cabacancha clearly represent an early instantiation of an Inca architecture of power and would have been even more impactful in their time, considering that this complex really looks nothing like anything else in the Sacred Valley during the Kilke period. Um, so now Moving down to Palu, uh, which is found on the valley floor directly below Cabacancha. This is the estate where Yawar Wakak's mummy was reportedly held. There are no buildings preserved here, unfortunately, but there's a lot of terracing platforms um, and canals and other hydraulic features in this area that extend along the southern rim of the Sacred Valley. At Palu, I think we start to see the beginnings of the Inca's development of the valley floor to support irrigated agriculture and more intensive investment uh, in landscape development, including canalization. Whereas at a lot of these local hilltop villages that we've looked at, it doesn't look like the Incas are really interfering with or reorganizing local agricultural production. At Palu, we also documented this sort of oval-shaped oval platform uh, that we found in the middle of this maize field which might have had some kind of monumental or ideological function in association with the estate. And then um, just to jump back to tombs for, for a moment before we moved over to the last site, um, I wanna mention uh, about cliff tombs, which we, find, we tend to find along the valley floor and in association with Inca context. Uh, this image here shows part of the cemetery at the Inca state of Pisac. There's a huge cluster of cliff tombs here, which are these sort of small openings here. These tombs were originally closed, um, but the openings that you see were caused by uh, looters in search of uh, grave goods. These tombs were generally uh, built to be closed. Um, they're very small, so they would have been single occupant, very simple in appearance, and are often built in sheer cliff faces. In this way, this kind of tomb is really different from chulpas, um, as it's clear that there was really no intention to continue physically interacting with the dead after interment. And um, I wanna draw attention to the fact that even though uh, these tombs seem to be very modest in appearance, it would have actually been quite dangerous and complicated logistically in a lot of cases to build some of these tombs that are positioned in, in vertical rock outcrops. Um, so the energy and planning involved uh, would have been substantial. These tombs seem to have almost been absorbed or sort of blend into the rock outcrop. So they kind of sacrifice accessibility in order to privilege a closer relationship with the local geology. Um, and for my next uh, phase of field work, I'm hoping to get funds to rate, uh, run some radiocarbon dates for tombs. But as of yet, we don't have any dates for this type of tomb in the area. And as I mentioned about the chulpas, um, Tombs were likely built into the Inca period, uh, but I still wanted to mention this as a cultural practice that started in the Kilke period and was definitely um, very important to sh uh, shaping the political landscape at this time. We did actually recover a few um, shards of classic Inca pottery in a cliff tomb near the valley floor. Um, so I think that there is uh, definitely evidence to indicate that in some cases, the Incas were interring their dead in cliff tombs in the Sacred Valley, and that this is another way that we can see the Incas claiming and remaking places and interrupting local landscapes by embedding their ancestors into geological formations. Okay, so the last site that I want to 
talk about is Minas Mojo, which is located on this bridge overlooking Calca right here. Some of we, what we know about the groups occupying this region comes from Cieza de Leon, who talks about how groups living in Calca were involved in prolonged conflict with the 8th Inca Huiracocha. So this appears to be an early site. We just find Kilke pottery on the surface here. It looks like an outpost for strategic and logistical purposes, probably associated with early expansion into this area. The site is composed of two groupings of rectangular and square shaped structures. Also, there are some platforms that were built to level the terrain to accommodate uh, these structures. On the outermost part of the ridge, there are these two square shaped um, storage structures. And um, this site actually bears a remarkable resemblance to another site, which is located in the Chongo Basin called Wilcana, which is unfortunately in a really poor state of preservation, but it seems to have a very similar layout uh, with this series of rectilinear structures and two square shaped structures on the outermost part of the ridge. And uh, Wilcana is also positioned in the middle of this uh, local agricultural landscape with a really good view of the surrounding area. So it might be another example of um, one of these early outposts. This is just to give you a view of um, these uh, square shaped uh, storage structures and um, uh, the view of the, the valley below. This is one of the rectangular structures at the site. The masonry is pretty rough, but the blocks are of a roughly regular size and shape. The stone is quarried from local outcrops. And um, again, it's very different from the local vernacular masonry and architecture in the area. The walls are quite thick and double-faced. Double there are large niches in these uh, rectangular buildings at the site, pretty similar to those at Rosas Cancha, um, which is a sector of the uh, estate of Huiracocha at Kakia Hakiwana. Uh, this is another site that seems to have been directly planned and built by the Incas. So um, I think we're starting to see some patterns and also some variation in terms of settlement planning and construction technology that start to prompt questions about standardization and specialization in early Inca architecture. And almost immediately beside the site, there's a large set of terraces these terraces don't have any irrigation canals, so they probably would have relied uh, mostly on natural irrigation, but they have these pretty thick masonry faced wall, uh, retaining walls. So uh, there's a pretty significant investment of labor here. There's also um, a wall running transversely through the terrace complex right here. So it, this might've been used for delimiting use rights uh, to different groups. Um, there are a few uh, Inca storage structures located above these terraces and also at Minas Mojo. So it might be that Incas that the Incas were overseeing production here and that Minas Mojo was positioned to facilitate the collection of tribute. But um, yeah, the, the implications of this are still somewhat unclear. So to conclude, based on this pre uh, preliminary evidence, we can start to see how local groups uh, adapted the um, landscapes in the Sacred Valley to support their lifeways at the beginning of the Kilke period. Although there are commonalities in terms of how these landscapes were modified, there's also evidence for diversity and dynamism and localized trajectories of innovation. In local villages, uh, Inca power was mediated largely through local uh, traditions, but even still the construction process could have disrupted local authority and conventions of labor organization. Generally, it doesn't appear that the Incas uh, reorganized local agricultural production in a uh, village context, but uh, rather they began to focus er even early on um, on developing the, the valley floor for the cultivation of maize. Um, only, in the only in the case of uh, the Waliakan, who had a particularly close relationship with the Incas, did the Incas uh, start to invest in building monumental architecture that deviated strongly from local traditions. Elsewhere, the Incas started to build small enclaves in local landscapes that might have sought to control local production and facilitate logistical and dip, uh, diplomatic operations. Um, the architecture here shows some evidence of early standardization and was probably built by, by non-local laborers. 
This intrusive construction and development would have gradually interrupted local landscapes and would have been crucial to legitimizing Inca claims. But I think it's still unclear how much power the Incas really had early on, as well as the degree to which locals were able to maintain autonomy over the course of this period. So these are just a few of some of the issues that I'm hoping to explore further uh, in my future research. So thank you. I look forward to responding to your questions and comments. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Julia, for the talk. I really appreciate you trying to explain a little bit more how the Incas operate in this really fragmented uh, geopolitical landscape. And since they were having different type of strategies, and you're using like uh, different uh, variables to analyze tools, architecture, agricultural lands, infrastructure to understand, I guess, in their own right, every barrel to see how this process of transformation and appropriation in the beginning of the Inca times worked. So I will let pass to the questions. We have here already a couple of questions. I will let you know the questions. So I'm going to read you the questions. So Mark asked, do any of the current, the current inhabitants claim this structure of those where their ancestors were buried? And what stories do they tell about these structures? That is an excellent question. Um, I wish that I'd had an opportunity to um, talk more with some of the local inhabitants of these communities. Um, generally, they don't tend to indicate that they see these structures as being um, as being built by their ancestors. Um, but I think that this is an issue that I would like to explore um, further uh, when I return to this area to continue um, my field work. But as of, as of now, I would say that most of the community members that I've talked with don't, uh, don't really see themselves as sharing any real uh, kind of relationship with the uh the the people that inhabited those regions in pre-hispanic times okay well also we have like kathy airs the same well done very informative thank you mom <laughs> was very informative this and we have uh, another comment from charles hastings excellent presentation I did not see in the photos much indication that sites have invested much in peripheral walls for beaches. Oh, that, that's true. Actually, we don't have too much, um, too much indication of any kinds of fortification or um, defensive works in this region. Um, the only aspect of these sites that might be considered defensive is their location on hilltops. But other than that, there's not too much indication of ongoing conflict uh, amongst these groups that would have necessitated the construction of defensive works. Good observation. Okay, we have another question from Tamara Bray. Thank you so much, Julia, for a nice talk. Can you say some more about the large platform identified by Wayakan? It's built up and fill it. It's it cut and level it. Can you say something about sites and height? Ah, that's a great question. Thanks for that, Tamara. Um, so this structure is, yeah, it's, it's sort of more built up. Um, so it there's uh, sort of a, a masonry based retaining wall surrounding the structure and um, uh, filled in with earth and fill um, on top of the hill. Um, in terms of its exact dimensions, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I have measured it. Um, so I have the dimensions on my computer and I can send them to you after this talk, but off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure exactly what its dimensions are. Well, um, we have another question from Mike Galati. Sorry if I missed this. 
Did you survey a space off site and beyond the races? If yes, how did you manage that? If no, are off site artifacts and a structure being missing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, um, the, the area that I worked in was already surveyed by uh, my advisor, uh, Alan Covey. So I mostly focused on working at sites that um, had been identified and had been, um, uh, and where uh, uh, Alan had indicated that there was uh, good preservation of architecture. We did conduct um, a little bit of reconnaissance around um, it in the, um, in the surrounding area around sites um, and in specific areas like in the Chongo Basin and uh, along the valley floor. Um, but yes, because of um, restrictions in terms of um, uh, resources and time, we didn't have a chance to really do uh, systematic reconnaissance uh, throughout the study area. Um, but this is again something that I'm hoping to uh, develop more and, and, and be more thorough about in the upcoming uh, field season. Well, I think we are having all the que questions answered. Um, well, surely I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mind. Perfect. Uh, between those three indicators, two architecture and agricultural infrastructure uh what do you think is the was more uh transformed by the incas ah that's a good question um i think that all of these different um ways of modifying the landscape were crucial to inca strategies of uh landscape transformation and uh, statecraft in this area, uh, in the Secret Valley. Um, I don't know, it's hard to say about one particular sort of strategy being uh, more important or more influential. Um, each of these different components played a very different role um, in supporting the Inca state. Um, and again, I don't want that to sound like just in terms of top down, all of this was negotiated and, um, there was a lot of local involvement too, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I would say um, it's really important to look at all of these different components sort of together and see how they interact with each other um, rather than uh, separating architecture from terraces, for example, or terraces from tombs. Um, so. Okay, thank you. That's very informative. So, well, we're going to thank you again for being this talk thanks to everybody for attending this talk we will wait for everybody for for next uh, talk next friday and um, i will close this session for today so thanks to everybody for attending another brown bag talk